The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. Tonica Jenkins had a gift for manipulating people. She used that gift to scam her way into getting into Yale. This serial con artist would end up facing federal drug trafficking charges, which led to her darkest scheme yet, roping her family into faking her own death by killing another woman. The only problem? The victim survived. I'm Vinny Politan, and welcome to the Court TV Podcast. This week, we have an audio edition of our original series, Accomplice to Murder, which untangles this shocking web of deception. Have a listen. This is the Court TV Podcast with Vinny Politan. The story of Tonica Jenkins, an ambitious, confident, cold-blooded would-be killer, is one that's probably better suited for a Stephen King novel rather than a true crime documentary. And it all started here in this neighborhood in East Cleveland. East Cleveland, it's a um, working class neighborhood with beautiful houses. So people do take pride in being citizens of East Cleveland, but um, it's seen its better days. It's struggling economically. Tonica Jenkins was born in 1975 to her mother, Tanika. They are spelled the same way, but they are not pronounced the same way. Mara and Taz are co-hosts of the podcast, Sisters Who Kill. And growing up, people would say that Tonica was a go-getter. She did well in school, and she really was driven to reach her goals. Tonica Jenkins was a pretty smart person in high school. Um, she uh, attended uh Cuyahoga Community College. This just was not challenging her enough. She wanted to up her studies and get the best education she could. So she decided to apply for the Yale University. She puts together a package and applies in her neuroscience program. They looked at her, her transcripts. They looked at her reference letters. They thought she'd be an ideal candidate she got accepted into the graduate program at Yale University with about $16,000 worth of scholarships. She gets to Yale and it's the fall of 1997. Her first semester, she kind of skates by, but she keeps telling all her teachers, oh, I'm sick, oh, I can't come to class because of this, and her professors start getting very suspicious. One of Tonica's professors brings his concerns to the Yale admissions office. An admissions officer begins calling the schools Tonica said she attended. He was met with, who is Tonica Jenkins? The transcripts were falsified, the GRE scores falsified. None of the credentials that she's provided to get into this university are actually legit. They arrest her and she leaves kicking and screaming. The case of Tonica Jenkins first came to my attention, I believe it was in December of 1997. The fact that I can recollect it this many years later uh, just goes to show how un unusual it was. Her defense attorney is like, listen, in the grand scheme of things, these aren't really big charges. Let's go ahead. Let's plead out. Let's find a deal. In July of 1998, everybody is at court waiting for Tonica to show up for her hearing. But Tonica fails to show. Investigators went to her house the next day and they found her there. She tells the police an incredible story. I was kidnapped. I was taken at gunpoint. I was tied up. She had claimed that she had been abducted, sexually assaulted, put in the trunk of a car, and driven to Philadelphia uh, on the day that she was supposed to appear in court. No one has managed to come up with that excuse before. And she has the photos to prove it. There was a, a letter sent to Yale along with a photograph of her. It was very much summer theater camp, and the judge was like... The judge was not having any of it. He increased her bond from $10,000 to $150,000. To further complicate matters, once she had been taken back into custody, she assaulted three corrections uh, department personnel. Assault is added to the Yale charges along with failure to appear in court and lying to police. 
Well, now she's facing perhaps up to a maximum of 50 years incarceration. Miraculously, Tonica's lawyer convinces the judge to offer her essentially the same plea deal. She was still going to be given the opportunity to plead guilty, receive probation, and repay the money. I think that's the sweetest deal you could possibly get mm -hmm. under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of the better one. Tonica was clever, but not necessarily smart. In my view, smart tends to look down the road a little bit further to see what the consequences might be. After scamming her way into Yale and escaping decades in prison, you might think Tonica would have learned her lesson. But just four months later, the police are tipped off by an informant saying that there is somebody looking to buy 10 kilos of cocaine down in Florida. Coming up, Tonica Jenkins graduates from low-level forgery into a career as an up-and-coming international drug dealer. The impression that we got was that, that it was amateur night, that we were dealing with a couple of amateurs that didn't know what they were doing. Tonica Jenkins had managed to scam her way into Yale and escaped with no jail time. But instead of laying low, she came here to Florida, her mother in tow, with a new plan, even crazier than the first. She's shifting gears, and now the gears she's shifting is into another money-making uh, proposition, and that's to uh, buy cocaine from Tampa and bring it up to Cleveland to sell. Tonica and her mama have a deal to go and buy this cocaine. This is like the start of their brand new life. They pack up their bag and they head down to Florida to meet their dealer. They thought they were purchasing uh, drugs from a drug dealer in Tampa who was responsible for importing the cocaine and then sold it once it got here in the United States. Eventually, a time was set that they were to show up with $90,000 and then we would provide them with 10 kilos of cocaine. And once they took possession of the cocaine, we were going to arrest them. Um, I guess I'll be leaving out of the money. Okay. Where's the problem? Well, when you see the money, I call the problem. You know how they go. Tonica and Tanika showed up with a lot of ones and fives that were unbanded and were kind of just stuffed into a bag. One part of the sting operation in particular stood out. It was, uh, it was Tanika, it was the mother. It was actually quite surprising because she actually took a knife and cut open one of the kilos and taste tested the cocaine, which surprised all of us because that's not something that somebody in their right mind does. Once we provided them the cocaine and did the transaction, that was the crime. So at that point, they were arrested and the operation was over. Please, As usual, Tonica had a perfectly reasonable explanation they were actually working undercover for the FBI. I said, let me get this straight. You're going to come down here, commit a felony, and buy 10 kilos of cocaine, and gonna just drop it on the FBI's desk? She said that they were going to give five kilos to the FBI, and that they were going to keep five for themselves. So at that point, I pulled my pen out, and I began writing notes for everything that she said. But this isn't New Haven anymore, and the federal government isn't messing around. Based upon uh, Tonica's prior criminal history, she was facing a term of incarceration for anywhere from 10 to 25 years. April 23rd, 2001 was going to be a trial in Florida on very, very serious federal conspiracy uh, trafficking uh, charges. But true to form, Tonica manages to keep herself out of prison for the time being. Her lawyers have worked out this deal where not only does Tonka get to go back to Cleveland, but she doesn't even have to stay in jail while she awaits her trial. She actually gets to stay at home on house arrest. Uh, U.S. Attorney's Office here in Tampa uh, didn't like that and they objected to that because one of Tonica's convictions that she had from the entire fiasco at Yale University was failure to appear. So we knew we were dealing with somebody that was, at the bare minimum, was devious. But even Agent Grant didn't suspect just how devious and murderous Tonica's next plot would be. She's waiting for her April trial date. She is now free from federal monitoring because she has figured out a way to manipulate the ankle monitor so that federal authorities do not know that she has left her house. She needed the law, law enforcement to believe 
that she no longer existed. So at this point, Tanaka's like, I escaped jail the first time, but this time I'm facing 20 years. Not really trying to do that. So she's like, you can't go to jail if you're dead. So she decides she's going to fake her own death. But to fake her own death, she needed a body double. So she recruits her cousin, Kyle Martin, as an accomplice. Kyle's like, what do you need? She says, I need you to find a girl who looks like me, about my height, my skin color, everything like that, and I need you to make sure she smokes crack. Kyle finds Melissa Latham. Now, Melissa was addicted to drugs at the time, and it's she seemed like a likely target. About the same build as Tonica, about the same skin complexion. She could pass. It was a diabolical plot recruiting what is a street term would be strawberry. That's someone who is addicted to drugs, sells her body out on the streets in order to sustain her drug addiction. In her scheme, she's decided that she is going to have Melissa go and get dental work under her name and then burn her body. So when they look and they say, okay, we can't recognize the face or anything, what are they gonna do? They're gonna pull the dental records. And Tonica Jenkins then would be the deceased Tonica Jenkins and unable to complete her sentence for the cocaine conspiracy. After driving around East Cleveland, they find Melissa walking the streets. Kyle makes her an offer she can't refuse. He says, hey, I have a proposition for you. How would you like to make some fast, easy money doing an insurance scam? And she's like, sure, I would like to make some fast, easy money doing an insurance scam. And he's like, great, we're going to take you to the dentist. You can have all the work done and we're going to pay you $100 per dentist appointment. So they bring her back to Tonica's house and they say, hey, you can sleep in the basement down here. Then the next day they head to a dentist appointment. Tonica registered the woman under Tonica's name and I believe also dressed her in a Yale sweatshirt. Now Tonica tells Melissa, I want you to wear these gloves and we're going to pretend like your hands are injured and I don't want you to fill out any forms. My client filled out the application form, signed the form, and sent the strawberry, Ms. Latham, in to have her teeth x-rayed. Behind me is where the house used to be. If you take a look, you can see it's been torn down, the grass has grown back in. Now, after Melissa had filled out that paperwork, Kyle and Tonica brought her back here and again offered her a place to stay down in the basement. When Melissa wakes up, she's kind of by herself, so she kind of stumbles into the bathroom. It's completely dark in the basement. As she walks out of the bathroom and into the darkness, Kyle punches her in the face and Tonica jumps on her. During the struggle that follows, Tonica injects Melissa with a lethal dose of insulin. But in spite of being stabbed dozens of times, Melissa continues to struggle. That's when Kyle picks up a brick. Kyle Martin said, that stuff isn't working. And so plan B was the brick. He then proceeds to pound her head over and over again. When Melissa Latham finally stops moving, Tonica tells Kyle she's going to get a rug to burn the body in, and they both leave the basement. Coming up, there was only one flaw in their plan. Melissa Latham isn't dead. By the grace of God, I got up. And I went to go out the door, and the door knob was gone. After being beaten with a brick and injected with insulin, Melissa Latham manages to escape the basement she'd been lured into by Tonica Jenkins and Kyle Martin. Police were called to a Kentucky Fried Chicken in this East Cleveland neighborhood. Inside, they found Melissa Latham cowering behind the counter. The employees at Kentucky Fried Chicken called the police to try to get them to eject this person that has jumped over the, the, the counter. And as they're looking at her, I'm sure they're thinking, here's a person who's under the influence of drugs, who's probably paranoid, uh, who's telling this fantastical story of somebody's trying to kill her. And next thing you know, a fine dress, Tonica runs down the street and she's like, stop them, officer. That's her. That's the bitch that stole my money. She's accusing uh, Melissa of trying to steal money from her and wants the police to arrest Melissa. What? 
And at this point, it's just like she is just always on, right? And girl, how did you get that outfit so fast? She was prepared. She had a contingency plan. She did. She did. In the meantime, Melissa's trying to tell the police, they're trying to kill me, her. This woman's trying to kill me and her cousin, uh, this Kyle Martin. Me being a drug addict, they took her word over mine. And I guess that's the way the system works. Once the ambulance got there, I put into a diabetic seizure. Melissa was rushed to the hospital, and as soon as she got to the hospital, she lost consciousness. Unsure of who was telling the truth, the police put Tonica in the back of a police car, and they tracked down Kyle Martin. They question him, and he is sweating profusely. He's nervous. He's uncomfortable. He had the bite mark. He had the scratches on the, on the, uh, on the neck. And they decide to detain Kyle Martin for further questioning. So Tonica decides she's going to calmly talk to the cops. Hey, officers, I see the problem over here. This woman, I know she looks disheveled and all. That's because my cousin Kyle just fought her off because she just stole from him. You know, she's the problem. The police look at Tonica. Again, she's a master manipulator. And she convinces them that she has no role in this. And they decide to let her go. Overnight, Melissa's condition stabilizes. The following morning, she is able to talk to the police and tell the investigating officer, Detective Cleveland, what she remembers. Uh, Melissa has come to. She's telling this fantastical story about uh, this conspiracy, and she's telling them, you've got to believe me, they tried to kill me. Detective Cleveland didn't believe me at first, and I'm telling them, like, that's her, she did this to me. The police do get a search warrant for the house. They go down to the basement, and while they're in the basement, they see the mother, Tonica Clement, down there cleaning the basement. And she's at the bottom of the stairs with the rag. Now the police kind of they sniff around, and I'm like, it smells in bleach in here. Ma'am, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, the dog's made a mess down here. I'm just cleaning it up. They go down there, and not only do they not see any dog feces or urine or anything, but they see blood on the floor, and they're like, well, look at here, we're at a house on Delmont, <laughs> and there's a pool of blood in the basement, just as Melissa describes. They actually uh, um, issue arrest warrants for Tonica and her mother, but by then, both Tonica and Tanika are gone. So Tonica, having been able to walk away from the scene of a, of a homicide she was going to commit, gets into a car and drives down to uh, Florida with her mother to stand trial for drug conspiracy charges. Ever the optimist, Tonica has decided that she can still beat the federal drug charges in Tampa. I don't know what she was thinking because considering the time that she was looking at, I figured she would cooperate and she would do everything that she could to get her time liability reduced and she didn't. She stayed on the defense that she was working for the FBI. During the trial, Agent Grant gets a curious phone call from the East Cleveland Police Department. They told us the story about what happened to Melissa Latham and uh, Tonica and Tanika's participation in it. And they asked us if we had a picture of her. And we kind of looked at each other, started laughing. We said, have a picture of her. We have her down here in federal court in trial. But when Agent Grant returns to the courtroom, Tonica and her mother are nowhere to be found. Once we realized that they were gone, we fanned out through the courthouse to try to find them. Well, the U.S. Marshals actually stopped them. The son had pulled the car up to the front of the courthouse. They were literally stopped them on the steps. They were trying to leave. So we brought them back upstairs, and our trial continued after that, and uh, they were found guilty. Tonica is sentenced to 24 years in prison for conspiracy to sell cocaine. And she must now return to Cleveland to face decades worth of charges for attempting to kill Melissa Latham. If Tonica would enter a plea and we could have worked something out in that respect uh, to a lesser offense, the judge would give her concurrent time, meaning Tonica would not have to do a single day more in prison for what happened to Ms. Latham. Tonica says that's not good enough. 
and she deserves better than that. She feels like she can do better than that, and she decides that she rather go to trial. The trial of Tonica Jenkins for the attempted murder of Melissa Latham began on February 4th, 2003, here at the Cuyahoga County Courthouse. By now, the story had gone national. And as I opened up the file and start reading it, I say to myself, well, this, maybe this is, maybe this, somebody's playing a joke here. Maybe this is a Hollywood script. Tonica and her mother are extradited back to Ohio to stand trial for attempted murder where they will face assistant prosecutor Soleil Awadala. I think one of the biggest challenges was you look over to the defense table and there was a uh, meek looking older woman in Tonica Clement, her mother, a grandmotherly figure with a uh, very put together young lady in, in Tonica Jenkins. Is the state prepared? Yes, yes, sir. And is the defense prepared for openings? <coughs> yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Awadala. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Grab her body up. Let's take her next door to the abandoned building and let's burn her up. Who is the speaker here? The evidence will show that the person making that statement is one, Tonica Jenkins. One of the prosecution's first witnesses was a receptionist at the dental office where Tonica allegedly took Melissa to get her teeth x-rayed. At the time when uh, these two women walked in, was this one of the women? Yes. Uh, and who did you understand this woman to be? Tonica Jenkins. And why did you think that? Well, when she came in, I handed her the papers. She said that was her appointment. Could you take a look at these, Ms. Fairbaum? What is the state's exhibit F2 and F3? This is our registration form. Do you remember who handed you, handed back to you these uh, documents? The woman in the picture. Not? No. Not the defendant sitting over there in the pink? No. Was there anything unusual about the woman in the picture uh, with regards to what she was wearing? She wore a baseball cap that she never took off, also black isotoner gloves. We had the dentist come in and say he did take x-rays and identify uh, the x-rays. Do you recognize what C1 is? Yeah, that's the picture of Tonika Jenkins that came to my office. Okay. So you know C1, which really is a picture of Melissa Latham, as Tonika Jenkins. That's what she told us that day. The prosecution's case rested on convincing the jury that Tonica Jenkins was the mastermind behind the plot to kill Melissa Latham. But now, the defense set out to cast Tonica as an unwitting accomplice to an attempted murder orchestrated by her cousin, Kyle Martin. There's no question this Melissa Latham took a beating. But that beating was at the hands of Kyle Martin. Not Tonica Jenkins, not Tanisha Clement. That, I believe, was, was their, their strategy going in, um, shifting the blame to Kyle. Kyle was a convicted criminal. Kyle was also a um, drug user and smoked crack with, with Melissa. Tonica and her mother had nothing to do with it. Kyle's own statements to the police after being arrested supported their version of events. He claimed that he became paranoid from smoking about a half ounce of dope, and when he went through Melissa's pockets, he noticed that $800 in crack was missing. They began to wrestle, and she bit his left arm, after which he punched her once in the forehead and once in the back of the head. As part of a plea deal, Kyle agreed to testify against his cousin that he was the unwitting accomplice and that Tonica was the real mastermind. Mr. Shaughnessy and I shared the fear that Kyle Martin would testify truthfully 
to corroborate what Ms. Latham had said. So we had the fear that he may take the stand. Kyle is set to show up. He's set to testify against his cousin. He gets on the stand and he starts pleading the fifth. On the advice of counsel, I'm exercising my Fifth Amendment right not to be called as a witness. I'm refusing to be sworn. And you will answer no questions put to you? I will answer no questions. Right. He would not testify against his cousin or his other relatives. Even though he, he declared to the world that he would, um, and, and, and just that, seeing a guy who's even afraid to testify against Tonica, um, uh, I think uh, said, said a lot. Coming up, all eyes turn to Melissa Latham. Everybody was watching me. I felt like I was about to pass out. I walk up here, I'm like, Melissa, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. I tell myself that all the way up to the stand. With Kyle Martin taking the fifth and refusing to testify against his cousin, it is now up to Melissa Latham to convince the jury that it is Tonica, not Kyle, who is the mastermind behind a devious plot to escape federal drug charges by faking her own death. We had to move on and, and figure out how to present the case with the other witnesses. Um, we would have loved to have him testify and tell another insider uh, viewpoint. But fortunately for us, Melissa was there. It was very stressful because she had good lawyers. She had really expensive lawyers. Melissa Latham was far from the perfect witness. Melissa is a drug addict. She's been in and out of jail. She doesn't have a clean slate. So is the jury actually going to believe her? And if they do believe her, are they going to be sympathetic? And Tonica is betting that they won't. So Melissa has cleaned herself up. She's dressed nicely and she is fully prepared to face Tonica in court. Right. And Tonica is sitting there, stone cold, no, blank no. face, staring her down. Even in court, she still was looking like I'm going to get away with this. Like she was a psychopath for real. Even left, they yes, she was. For two minutes before My I client thought she would be either time. dead on the corner Changing slab from her drug addiction so or not show up, but she was wrong. I bring your attention back to the date of April 2001. And all I could do was tell my truth and look at the jury and let them know this is what happened to me. Could you tell us how you came to meet Ms. Jenkins? Okay, I believe it was about 2.30, 3 o'clock a.m. And I was walking up Euclid, mm, trying to pull up in a red car. I'm like, what's going on? She's like, um, you want to make some money? I'm like, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. What do you want me to do? She said, it's an insurance thing. She said, I can give you $50 now, $50, you know, when it's done. I didn't care what insurance thing she was talking about. I was seeing dollar signs. And so did you agree to participate in this insurance scam? Yes. Was going with them that night part of this? Yes. Where did you go after you got into the car? So we proceeded to go buy the drugs. And see, that's the problem. When you want drugs, you don't think. You just, you, 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 your mind be clouded and you just go with the flow. After visiting the dentist the following day and getting paid for what she thinks is an insurance scam, she and Kyle get high. The next thing she remembers is waking up the next morning in a dark basement. And what happens in this dark basement? Okay, in the dark basement, I felt somebody swing at me. When he grabs me by the neck, all of a sudden the light, the light comes on. Both Tonica and Kyle persisted kicking me, stumping me, telling me, shut up, bitch, shut up, bitch. Tonica Clement, her mother, was a diabetic, so she had access to insulin. And so she injected uh, Melissa Latham, and Melissa Latham was not a diabetic. So the thought was we were going to put her into a, a hypoglycemic coma that would lead to her death. How many times did she inject you with that needle? It had to be about 15 to 16 times. And what part of your body was she injecting? Arms. Legs, thighs, wherever she could get the needle. What happened after she injected you with the insulin? <clears throat> Kyle picked up the um, brick. And she was like, well, just hit her with the brick, just hit her with the brick. So he grabbed the brick and started hitting me in the head. So the first two hits, I still was fighting. I felt the ringing and the heat, but I never passed out. He hit me again with the brick. 
So after I ran out of fight, I acted like I was dead. What was Tonica Jenkins doing when Kyle Martin had that brick in his hand? All I know is that while he was hitting me with the brick, blood had got on his arm and he, she was like, make sure you wash your hands real good when you get finished. When, I, when they was trying to murder me, I seen my whole life flash before my eyes. It's scary. You know, I had accepted it for a second, but then I'm like, oh no. And now she hears them walking upstairs, locking the door. She then jumps up, adrenaline kicked in, and runs up, tries to get out of the basement, finds it that it's locked without a, a door knob. So I had to go back in the basement, find something to open the door with, which I found the spoon. I went back up, put the spoon in the, in the part where the door knob go, twisted it, and it opened. And there was this great big pit bull sitting there. She said, now look, dog, I'm going out the door. I don't know what you're going to do. And now, mind you, I got blood all over me, half naked. So it just so happened the security door was unlocked. So I went out the, the first door, then I ran over to KFC. Ran behind the <coughs> counter and asked them to please call 911. They called the police, and when the police came, Tonica came in with them. What was she doing there? Accusing me of stealing $1,000. What happens then after she accuses you of stealing this thousand dollars? I told the police, if y'all don't believe me, just go over there and look. It should be a puddle of blood in the basement. She destroys Tonica in court, and she tells everything that happened. The entire courtroom, and especially the jury, they are shocked and just in awe about how much Tonica would do to try to get away with crime. She did a great job. Um, standing up for herself. But we had to prepare her to get up there uh, being cross-examined by two skilled uh, defense attorneys. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, cross. Their, their strategy was to um, try to knock down the credibility of, 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 of Melissa. Your testimony earlier about no felony convictions was accurate, correct? Yes. However, you were convicted of a theft offense in Maple Heights, were you not? Yes. The worst thing was her attorneys uh, interrogating me. That was the hardest part. Being a zealous advocate for my client as a defense lawyer, some would call it sleazy. I think it's good lawyering to do the best you can, even if you're bending the rules of evidence a little bit, and asking about convictions for hooking on the street or drug abuse convictions. Now, why don't we discuss your crack cocaine habit? When did you begin using crack cocaine? About four years ago. The defense strategy was you, you can't believe Melissa. Melissa was a crack user. Melissa was a liar. At the height of your cocaine abuse, how much would you be spending? At the height of it, $40 a day. It never got up into the $100 range? Mm-mm, not when I was spending it. Ms. Latham did a great job in trial. She was tough to rattle on cross-examination. Both Tom and I tried our best. All right, ma'am, you may step down. Thank you. They said I did a pretty good job, though. All I did was told what the truth. That's all I did was told the truth. But Tonica wasn't the only one on trial. Her mother was being tried simultaneously for obstruction of justice. The original conspiracy to, to commit the aggravated murder was a felony of the first degree. So she's looking at up to a decade in prison there. In representing Ms. Clement, I can tell you that um, what I saw is a lady that loved her daughter very much. And I think was, was willing to do anything she could to protect her. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. She was equally as responsible for everything that happened as Tonica was. This is the supportive mother. Whether she deserves the support or not. Correct. Do you solemnly swear that this testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I help you God? I do. Blood is thicker than water. I don't mean that as a pun just because her mother was cleaning up the blood in the basement with the uh, rag with bleach. The strongest witnesses against my client were the, um, the officers that described that she was involved with cleaning products and or rags and things of that nature. Did you smell some cleaning products? Yes. Smelled like a uh, strong odor of bleach. All right. And did she have anything in her hand? Yes, like a towel or a rag. All right. And did she say anything to you? I asked her what she was doing, and she told me she was cleaning. 
that. Did she say why she was cleaning? She said she was cleaning because the dogs made a mess in the basement. She knew what her daughter was about to do. She supplied the insulin. And while they was down there beating me, she, they, she was having a conversation with Tonica from the top of the steps. I never seen her, though, until the court session. She never showed her face, but she was talking from the steps into the basement. That's not somebody that's along for the ride. That is somebody that's a full participant. The trial of Tonica Jenkins and her mother concluded on February 11th, 2003. Is the state prepared for closing arguments? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Melissa Latham's life had to be snuffed out in order for Tanika Jenkins and her mother to benefit. Ask yourself, what was she doing out there at 2 o'clock in the morning on the 20th? What was she doing? And I submit to you that she was hunting. We had the motive, we had the plan, the method, and now it's, ladies and gentlemen, it's up to you. Uh, thank you very much once again. Thank you. I guess the main cog would be to just indicate to the jury that uh, Melissa Latham was uh, not a credible witness. We got Melissa Latham, who realizes that she will probably go back to jail if she doesn't steer the guilt away from herself for stealing that money. So she concocts this story and tries to incriminate not only Kyle Martin, but Tonica and her mom. Melissa Latham had been beaten with a brick and injected with what should have been a lethal dose of insulin, but miraculously survived to testify against her attackers in court. She didn't have to wait long for the jury to come back with a verdict. You got Nancy Grace on the TV. Melissa Latham, the victim, is on her way now. I'm like, oh my God, I was overwhelmed. Girl, it was crazy. The, the, uh, the camera people felt like paparazzi. No offense, John. Has the jury reached a verdict? Correct. We, the jury in this case, being duly impaneled and sworn, do find the defendant, Tonica Jenkins, guilty of attempted aggravated murder of Melissa Latham, signed by all 12 of the jurors. Truth is stranger than fiction. And the truth of this case, according to the jury's findings, Tonica was a diabolical individual with the brains, had they been set on the right course in life, could have led her to great things instead of where she's at now. She was sentenced to 20 years, and this is on top of the 24 years that she was sentenced in Florida for the drug charges. So now she has to consecutively serve 44 years in prison. She just thought she was smarter than everybody else. Obviously not. Melissa was there for the sentencing, and I know she was very happy and, and very uh, relieved that uh, the verdict was, was a guilty verdict and that uh, Tonica had been held accountable uh, for her actions. I thought the, the best part of this entire case was the fact that Melissa Latham did not die, and she was able to live her life. I just wanted, I wanted her to talk. I wanted her to say something. This is all she said. Due to the medication and my attorney's advice, I will not be speaking. And that was the only words I ever heard her say in my life, besides in that basement. She did not want to get up there because she knew ain't nothing she could say. Tonica's mother was sentenced the same day. We, the jury in this case, being duly impaneled and sworn, do find the defendant, Tonica Clement, guilty of obstructing justice. And it is signed by all 12 of the jurors. The mother and the daughter got up and walked away. I just watched them into thinking they was going to try to give me eye contact. They never did. I'm trying to get, they never looked at me. They just walked out with her hair down and walked away. They're led back to the holding cell. Tonica's mother, her conviction for a felony three obstructing justice, she got time served and was released. Tanika Clements spent 14 years in federal prison and was released in 2017. Tonica Jenkins finished serving her drug sentence and was transferred to Ohio to serve another two decades for attempted murder. Just a month before Court TV reached out to Melissa earlier this year, she received a letter from the Ohio prison system. They sent me a letter saying, uh, okay, Miss, Miss Latham, we're about to release Tonica into a halfway house. They, we, they wanted my feedback and wanted to know how I felt about it. I never responded to the letter, but I do would like to know what's going on with her. Kyle Martin's case was tried separately. Kyle Martin actually served as his own counsel in that first case. He placed the blame on Tonica. Kyle wants to shade his involvement 
as unknowing, an unknowing participant in this conspiracy. They found him not guilty of attempted murder and only found him guilty for kidnapping, for which he got 10 years. But because he represented himself, the Ohio Supreme Court later tossed out his conviction. Unfortunately for Kyle, in his second trial, he was convicted of attempted murder and sentenced to 15 years. Karma always come and get you. <laughs> Ain't nobody is them from karma. For Melissa, life after the trial has been mixed. The state of Ohio decided Melissa was ineligible for a fund set up to help victims of violent crime. They said that by me being high off a of felony drug, they did not give me not one penny. The amount of insulin that was in her body and the fact that now she has to have insulin for the rest of her life. Over two decades later, Melissa Latham still struggles to recover from that ordeal in that dark basement. The hardest thing I ever overcame was getting out that basement fighting for my life. I'm not going to sit here and say I don't. I still struggle, but it's getting better. I'm doing good, and they're trying to make me manager. I know it's not a big deal. It's because it's McDonald's, but I'm pretty good. And everybody at my job love me. She likes her job. I mean, it's, it's, it's a job. It, it's something that occupies her time. We cook out, you know, have our little beer or whatever, you know, just having a nice time with our family. She's still Melissa. She's still comical. She's still herself. But she doesn't dwell on the past or the woman who nearly killed her. I'm sure she didn't think about me. I bet you she think about me, but I don't think about her. Her main wish now is to reunite with the children she lost when she was addicted to drugs. I know y'all grown, but if y'all see this, please call mommy. I miss y'all so much. Y'all about to have me start crying. But I miss y'all so much. There you have it, another deep dive into a truly fascinating case. You can find more episodes of this Court TV original series on our website where they are available to stream for free. Just check the show notes for a link. And to keep up with the biggest current true crime stories, tune into my show, Closing Arguments, every weeknight at 8 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much for downloading. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.